to of course uh, consider in the times of advancements especially technological advancements and also uh, skill sets taking a whole new shape and form back in the day you needed to be qualified in a certain discipline for you to be able to get a job um, that you desired today things have changed education has changed today in some places education is accessible for free uh, today the elements that now require you to traverse gracefully in the job market is quite also different so the tech not this morning is going to be focusing on closing the skills gap in the higher education and of course the impact of multicultural education in diversity and the opportunities that do stand uh, for students especially those that have completed uh, their advanced level certificate what opportunities are there for you in this day and air whereby a course can be as short as two months and you get a job <laughs> versus the three four years uh, it used to be the customary education so there's so many uh, gaps but then opportunities also do present themselves anyway the digital gap in schools, the skills gap in the U.S. workforce has received a widespread attention, not just from the media, but also from academia, consultancies, and government agencies. As things do stand right now, higher education and post-secondary institutions have struggled to effectively prepare uh, job seekers for the workplace, which combined with unrealistic employee expectations regarding the skill sets of their new hires. And this has left many of students, millions of them, unfulfilled in the job openings. But also it begs the question, uh, who, uh, which other elements of this uh, industry have to be edited and improved upon to also receive the new kind of skill set that is on the market. And therefore you do have uh, university also being regarded so often as the natural next step back in the day after air levels. However, before you apply, you need to consider, is going to university actually necessary evil for you? Do you have to go to the university to acquire a skill set? Well, my guests this morning are going to, you know, poke some loopholes, uh, <laughs> and but also show you the opportunities. I am joined by Professor Patrick um, Chamanua, who's the Vice Chancellor Uganda Martyrs University. We also do have a beautiful lady, a Women's Month, so we have to celebrate the ladies here in the morning at NTV, and that is Fadila Sad, Director of Programs with the EduServe Educational Agency. And so I'm going to allow my guests to give us their salutations and then we dive into the discussion. I am Priscilla Regina Naluga, starting off with the Lady of the Month. Oh, thank you Priscilla for the warm welcome. Uh, good morning viewers, my name is Fadila Saad. I am Director of Programs at EduServe Education Agency. Mm -hmm. Alright, Professor? Good morning viewers, um, Patrick Chiamanua, Vice Chancellor at Uganda Matters University and happy to be here to share on this very important topic. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. Of course, uh, we know the university, it's been here for years. Uh, they had a celebration last year, it was? 30 years. 30 now, years yes. of existence as an influencing higher education institution. However, EduServe is one that is new on the block and they also have <laughs> uh, <laughs> a mandate, but they did find a loophole and a problem to which they offer a solution. What was the problem for Dila that uh, through which you thought EduServe Educational Agency would be the solution? I think um, that the urgent problem that EduServe Education Agency sought to solve is the gap between our, our students who graduate and the demands of the job market. So we realized, for example, in a very, very important industry like or sector like hospitality, Many of the hotels, many of the institutions were, okay, the major five-star hotels, they were only hiring foreigners to run those hotels to manage our hospitality industry. And yet we have so many fine institutions that are always churning out graduates in this sector. And so we realized what is it that they find attractive and appealing about Kenyans and Indians and uh, you know to come and run this industry and realized they have the kind of training and exposure that our students lacked. So we began to coordinate uh, internship placement programs for 
students who are uh, continuing students at university and fresh graduates. So these students, we have training partners in Europe and uh, USA where we place them when they are uh, almost before graduation, mm -hmm. we place them and they intern for 18 months. They will intern uh, at seven star hotels, they will get exposed to um, restaurants. And, and uh, these internships are in those continents? Yes. So our students who are graduated, who have graduated here in tourism and hospitality, before they graduate, they are they are placed in internships, mm -hmm. eighteen months internship, and they are, do a rotation in front desk, um, housekeeping, culinary. So when they come back with that international exposure, they and we now find that they are quickly absorbed into the hospitality industry. They are exposed. Um, they are very. Uh, creative, they are problem solvers, they are critical thinkers, and because it's a hands-on training, a hands-on practical, they get to practice what they learned in theory, and they get to practice it globally, where they get to interact with other students from similar programs from other countries, and so they get to network and learn new cultures, which we think is very critical when you are when they come back and are reabsorbed here in the hospitality industry and so we find that they are making a very huge impact and so many of our alumni are getting absorbed in five star hotels because of this program. Okay. Uh, yeah. Professor, uh, that is a subject that you've also had to revise as an institute to be able to produce better qualified, exposed mm -hmm. and uh, more informed uh, a, a class of um, you know, the labor market. Yeah. Uh, of course, we had a window that came in very recently. You remember the discussion about expired programs and stuff that universities were, were tasked to complete the review of programs. So it provided us that opportunity. And so we've had to rethink, even with the current trends on the market, mm -hmm. what w should our revised curriculum look like. Mm -hmm. And what we have so far started off with is to emphasize that industrial experience mm. because in contrast with the secondary school where largely students are just taught to pass the UNEB exam so that the school is ranked and can appear in the papers at the university that doesn't carry much attention because we never say oh the university is ranked this because it's a graduate this year passed this so now we are looking at people who are going out to impact on the economy, to impact on their societies, and people who will have the readiness for the job placing. Mm -hmm. So we are emphasizing that in the second and third year of the academic programs, there is a window, usually six to eight weeks, that students go out to the industry. And that's because experiential learning is very important for skilling of the graduate. I've had the privilege that I am from the medical field. I'm a surgeon. And in medical school, after the first two years, you are required to be on the ward mm -hmm. at least every day for the rest of the training, even through internship. And that contributes to our competence as medical doctors when we go out to the field. And I've been convincing my team that we should do the same even for arts and humanities and all other programs. That there is an element in the second and third year that takes the student to the industry. If you are doing agriculture, can you go and work say, at the district farm office? Mm -hmm. Can you go and work with the extension farmers? Can you can you be a faculty of built environment student and go to the work site? Because now we are requiring them to actually go and write a report. Mm -hmm. And that report must be signed by the contractor or the site supervisor. So that we know they have learned the nitty gritty of what actually happens in the industry out there. And they also get the skills and be able to focus on what is important beyond 
getting an upper setting in the first class mm -hmm. or whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, so our newly revised curriculum now were emphasizing that. And uh, there is, of course, some challenge in it because the the practice has been that lecturers are not used to letting their students away for a mm. period of time. Now that mindset the change are has parents to away from home. Mm. <laughs> yes. They want their you know buds under their wings all the time. Exactly, yeah. and sometimes some people have even challenged the qualifications of those that are going to supervise them at the workplace. Mm. But I mean, these will be their employers. They don't need to have a PhD or a master's. They are the employers. Mm -hmm. They are the actual implementers of what you're trying to teach in theory. So they don't need to be really accredited on an academic level. They are accredited in their field of specialization. And so we are having to contend with such mindset issues but it is the way we have to do it and I'm glad that this window of program accreditation came through so our programs have at least captured that and like we've said earlier we've also incorporated the entrepreneurship uh, module into all programs again to try and give this trainee the economic aspect of what they are learning you might qualify a lawyer, for example, mm -hmm. but they don't know how to fit into the economy. So you place them out there, they have a first class, they go to LDC and have excelled, but then they, they, they can't even run a law firm. They can't even think of and they, they, they can't even think that the other elements to the law firm yeah. exactly. <laughs> that require you to have knowledge about in order to traverse mm. the industry. Absolutely. So that entrepreneurship is going to help them acquire science. Okay. And it is beyond the theory. So we are spreading it over the program duration. But the theoretical component of the entrepreneurship is given in the first year. Okay, then so I guess what we, what, what both of you are trying to answer is how do we transform the labor market to be more competent uh, with what, yeah. it, what is present today. Now Fadila, in that regard, wh when you have taken the students out, they have acquired their experience international, as you have mentioned it, they have to come back and fit into uh, the dynamics present today. That's yeah. a very big gap right yes. there. And how have you managed to manage uh, the mindset and transition of those uh, that have received that nature of internship and then they have to come back? Do they really want to come back and work in the environment? Because the dynamics are quite different. <laughs> Europe is far ahead uh, That's true. <laughs> than where that's, we are. That's and so you find yourself, have, they have acquired skills, but those skills may not be yeah. as directly applicable in uh, Uganda and Skes? Yeah, that happens a lot, especially when they go for internships like in agriculture where they do a lot of modern farming. Mm -hmm. Yes, it happens a lot. However, one thing that we are very acutely aware of is that gap that you are talking about. Because we also are very, we also know that much as they have learned all these skills to be able to be better and, you know, to impact their communities in agriculture, to become more employable because they now know the modern way of working in the job market they are also we also are very cognizant of the fact that this is an the new trend of hiring in the job market currently especially post covid mm -hmm. is uh, attitude uh, employers are looking at attitude and this attitude can only be established or if some if a, a person has taken time to gain soft skills. And soft skills are transferable. So um, if you look at our students who are going, before they actually leave, mm -hmm. we do tend to take them training, with a lot of training. We do have a work readiness program at EDUSAF that we implement. It is, of course, targeted mainly to graduates. Uh, for graduates and we have realized that no matter how much knowledge someone has acquired there are still some skills that they need to learn interpersonal skills 
team building, I mean team wa working as a team, collaboration, organization, time management, communication is very key. So we, we know very well that, for example, a student who has come back and has worked under seven star hotels, of course, many of them don't want to come back. Mm -hmm. But of course, the consular requirements, they have to come back because they went as interns. And this internship is meant for them to come back and uh, impact and also become entrepreneurs in their own in their own sense. However, we know that if they do not have these skills, they will not integrate, and then we will have lost the entire purpose. Mm. So one of the key issues we have with our work readiness program is to make sure that they learn a lot of transferable skills. And um, to piggyback off what the professor was saying, yes, you made, we, we are now seeing um, many because I think some people have had either adequate career guidance mm -hmm. and some have not, the variables uh, which many students use and parents to choose the career path, the, the, you, it's not a blanket thing. It's, it's about your background, your economic status, mm -hmm. um, if your parents are educated. And sometimes people will tell you, you know what, you got the point, you get to go in government, just go. Now. That is one of the causes the rift, that gap between a, a graduate and the demands of the job market. So what we are saying is to the students, when you have graduated, when you are done with school, learning does not end there. True. We have to be more strategic. And this goes to, of course, parents and the students themselves and even the policy makers. It has now become very strategic. Whereby, like you mentioned earlier, there are courses which can certify you in two months and you're ready to be rolled out. So I'm thinking this is the attitude they have to bring towards growing themselves. We have to accept that change takes time. Most of the graduates we see on the market right now are a product of the old curriculum, mm -hmm. which the professor mentioned earlier that we were taught, me being one of them, mm -hmm. we were taught to cram, we were taught to pass exams. Mm -hmm. We were just taught to do that. And we were taught things that are not applicable. Ex exactly, they're not we are applicable. Maui, when we, <laughs> when we, when we reached the field, we yeah. realized that there were simple things like email writing that we could not do. Very true. To date, I see graduates, many graduates, did not know. They use the same they, language <laughs> they use for WhatsApp yes, messaging. Yes. Is how they send an email. They use slang. Grammar. Email. There's a lot of slang. They yeah. do not understand that corporate e uh, etiquette. Mm -hmm. They are not well versed with it. And yet these are things that when uh, some or when someone takes time and learns how to, to learn things like uh, to take on courses like to do with communication, uh, to take on things like those interpersonal skills. It doesn't matter what course you graduated in. Like uh, the professor said, you could, he could be a trained surgeon, but it is the soft, the skills, soft skills that make you a very in-demand okay. uh, candidate Which for the job market. Which uh, brings the professor here on a hot spot. You have, you have your courses. They're wonderful. They're fantastic. Yeah. They equip them with the technical, theoretical elements of it. But how are you incorporating soft skills in, you know, in the student yeah. that you are going to put out to the job market so that they say, this particular university, Ghana must university is take? Yes, that's a very good question and I would like to thank Fadila for bringing up the soft skills because really like you said again earlier people who are hiring well, they will put an academic requirement for you on the advert but actually when you step into that interview room mm -hmm. they are looking mm -hmm. at your attitude. Yeah. They are looking at the way you can face up to the panel and express yourself without fidgeting around and being audible, being clear. They are looking at whether you can give an example of a, of a situation where you came up with a solution. Mm -hmm. So these are the things. So what we are trying to do at Uganda Matters is there is a lot of group work assignments. Mm -hmm which forces the student to learn with others. So you've got to be able to fit within the group, be able to contribute, and then be able to submit a product as a group. Now, with that setting, 
it forces you to learn how to listen to others. It forces you to learn how to own up on what you say because it's supposed to earn you a mark in the group's assignment. And it forces you to learn how to communicate and also how to look for answers. Because in this digital era, we don't have to commit a lot to the memory. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We just have to know where to go if you need to find a, an answer to a yeah. given question. Now, that is very important because previously, if it wasn't in the teacher's notes, you didn't know it. Mm -mm. Okay. But that time has gone. Mm. These days, we want you to know everything in terms of how do I get the information. And this is, I think, what is giving market to chat DPT. Because people have realized, oh, I don't need to know it. But I can find it. Okay. Google it yeah. and so on. So those skills of f finding solutions, communication, listening, are coming through the group assignments. And of course, they have to present in the class. Yeah. That's before the group assignment collectively sits down and decides to use AI <laughs> to come up <laughs> with a, a complete assignment because there's so many AI, you know, opportunities out there that can can't easily do the work for you. You can't run away from mm -hmm. it. But there's another question that comes out of this discussion altogether at the end of the day. Professor, is that degree really important in this day and era? Yes and no. Uh, I've been fortunate to go to uh, professional trainings and part of my surgical training was done in Germany. And while there I learned a lot. Actually, in Germany they don't emphasize the degree so much. They emphasize the skill. Right and they emphasize the attitude. So you find there is a given f segment of the population that of course goes to university to earn a degree. But the majority of the actual labor force is from technical and vocational education institutions. The people you see assembling the Mercedes and, uh, and the Porsches and so on of this day don't have the degrees in engineering, mm. no. But they have gone to the vocational engineering training. They've learned the electric wiring, they've learned the, the uh, welding. For example, even back here in Uganda, in the oil industry, we are now extracting oil. But do you know that we didn't have expert welders, yet we have a lot of engineers? They've had to take people out to learn welding. Mm -hmm. You don't need a degree in that. Mm -hmm. But you have to demonstrate the skill, mm -hmm. so that when you weld this pipeline, it will stand the pressures being sent to it. So that skill is important for us to emphasize. Unfortunately, like I said earlier, the mindset has been, if you don't have a, a, a paper, a degree, you can't be employed. Yeah. And We've even seen some vocational institutions being turned into universities, again, mm. to emphasize the degree element. But I think we are getting it wrong. The actual people that do the work, you look, look at Kampala City and the buildings that we have. Yeah. How many engineers are on each building uh, uh, project? Very few. Mm. The rest are the artisan and other professionals. And that's where we should emphasize, because that is what gets the economy moving. And I think it's the reason why you know, countries like Uganda will thrive in other economies like mm. uh, Europe or the USA uh, because of the s those skills that we pick up from here. Mm. I have a friend of mine uh, who, uh, in, during COVID, they mm. started painting and so they started mm -hmm. getting jobs here painting. But today they are in the US and that skill yeah. is paying, <laughs> paying them yeah. right now. And so the emphasis on skills.
skill versus the academic or the ed the degree or you know that acquisition of that particular big certificate versus a skilling in different elements to be able to be more competent in yeah. today's competitive market. I'd like you to speak into that, Fadila. Well, I of course I cannot uh, really argue. Uh, against having a degree yeah. how because I think there's some value there is that having a bachelor's that experience really it transforms the mind it actually begins to prepare you to be independent especially like I said uh, personally I'll speak from a personal point of view we came from a level when we had crammed and then we passed and then we, we went to Macquarie University and then there was a bit of a culture shock. We now had to create our own notes. We had to make use of the library, you understand? In, in, in high school, library was where you went to dodge classes. Mm. But at university, you actually have to go and utilize it. You have to go and study. So it becomes, it also, it has an experience it gives you. But what we are saying that, yes, we appreciate it. However, they should, right now, with the demands of the current job market, mm -hmm. there has to be a big lean towards vocational and technical training. Okay. Yes, maybe the policymakers can ensure that it is uh, co-opted and it now instead of being seen as uh, certificates and diplomas where failures go, but it should now be seen as something that can be grown into a, a professional career path. You become a professional welder, you become mm. a professional electrician, mm -hmm. uh, you become a professional plumber. And I think we do have uh, the DIT that is yes, actually DIT focusing is doing on a good that. job in certifying them. Yes. However, we need to see this more on a more intense level and they need to be more practical. Be and there mm -hmm. need to be more opportunities with the government. I think whereas for us we are private agency, mm -hmm. we, we are beginning to realize that if a uh, because um, government uh, supports the internship programs, but they are largely looking at agriculture. And so for a long time, they have supported agriculture. However, I'm thinking, open it up. Let there be more support for people to go for these vocational internship trainings, like for welding. Let people go out there and let them be supported by government. Mm -hmm. Let them go and experience, like how, in you know, if you look at the story of China, there is a certain era, I think in the early 80s or 90s, where they sent many of their students to go and intern in American and European companies. And when, of course, now people are accusing them of stealing ideas, but they got those ideas and went back and they. These are the Improved these are the foundation them. of the yeah. of the country we see now and admire. If you look at the things most of them can do, I think we should be able to do such things here. Okay. We should be able to produce our own steam cards. Professor, you have a two cent on that. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. I think she's raising very good points, yeah. and indeed, we need to emphasize the vocational and the skilling. Mm -hmm. But there is another element that I think we need to start looking at and. Of course, we need to work with the professional bodies and yeah. the and the and the accreditation authorities, national council, and others to find a win-win situation. Mm. Because, like she said, you could be experienced in welding, but we still live in an era where degrees are still regarded, mm -hmm. especially in our setting. There is an element of recognition of prior learning and skills that we need to incorporate into the admission criteria so that someone comes in just for the completion to be grounded theoretically and scientifically in what they have actually already been good at but mm -hmm. might not know some of the underlying scientific aspects. So that should be able to help them come in, do a six or one year or nine month uh, part-time training and earn a degree. To, but that training is meant to ground them in the theoretical underpinnings of what they are doing. And the other thing is we need also to be able to recognize that for every degree holder mm. there has to be in most industries at least five to ten diploma or vocational training mm. assistance that mm. will help them in the implementation. Mm. So that is important to take 
into consideration so that we do not say that we are putting away the degrees, but mm -hmm. we recognize that the ratio has to be well managed. Yes. The ratio has to be well managed. Of course, we need the degrees also for the research aspect yeah. because new knowledge has to be. So, I, I guess collectively, um, we need to accept that we need to advance or yeah. allow evolution of how education is consumed Absolutely. by and large. Okay, so you have spoken about trends. Uh, 2024 is here, new academic year is upon you as an institute and also as the agency. And it begs the question what trends are there as you are taking in a new cohort? all together you have mentioned about the admission criteria uh, that has to change to fit the current times and so are you editing some of those um, criteria to be able to take in a new cohort yes we we have actually fortunately already caught up on that mm -hmm. as you will be aware we now have no reason why a student should repeat a level so and to, to bridge that gap, we have the higher education certificate, mm. which helps you come in, decide, do you want to be a scientist? Do you want to be in the arts? And then the HCE, the higher certificate, gives you the opportunity to go and brush up for six to nine uh, months, and then you go into your chosen university program. Mm -hmm. So that is helping now many students and parents to overcome the anxiety and disappointment of having not made the points. So that is one trend that we are taking advantage of. The other aspect we are trying to drive, it's not yet easy and we need government to come on board on this, is we live in a, a digital era mm -hmm. where e-learning and and e-research have become trendy and actually practiced now in academic, but the computer ownership is still very low. The ratios are still very poor. Okay. And some universities have tried to offer computers to students, but it comes at an additional cost. Mm. So there is need for government to look at such uh, application and uh, in equipment loans for students, just like we have the the HESFEB, the Higher Education Student Financing Board, giving loans. I think it's it would be good to have an affirmative action as a nation to say at least let every university and tertiary institution student own mm. a laptop. To facilitate, yeah. to facilitate learning, yeah. to facilitate global connections, because this is where you can start interacting very yeah. well with mm. other people mm. and learning. And then being able to see even the YouTube videos and other learning platforms Close. that yeah. are out mm. there. Take those short courses in yeah. your free time because mm. there is a lot of short courses, a lot of acquire In the space of three months. Which you can okay. acquire, yes. So <laughs> uh, Fadila, important. in closing as the agency also, what opportunities uh, do present themselves in 2024? Oh, we do have a lot of opportunities um, for graduate uh, students and uh, even those who are still continuing. Because like we said, as an agency, we seek to mainly basically say boost their CVs, mm -hmm. boost their resumes. Mm -hmm. We are also doing our part in making our students very competitive candidates for employment. And so we have opportunities for work readiness programs. We have opportunities for career guidance and matching you with mentorship, mentors, because we know it all starts with career guidance. Yeah. There is a lot of information out there. There is a lot of edu uh, like education out there, certificates, but how do you know the right how do you know the right path to take mm -hmm. and these days we are beginning to understand that there is a lot that we can do especially when it comes to career guidance we can look at your personality we can look at your interests and okay. we are beginning to realize that 
the things which people call hobbies, those are hidden talents that can actually be nurtured and then they can turn into a career that is certified. Okay. And then these are the people we are going to uh, put out there. So we are very um, we are very cognizant of the demands and we are matching them up. We are really trying to fill in that gap. All right. Yes. But the quote there is that they are matching them up, both of them in their different yes. capacities. They are matching up yeah, to the investments that are uh, <laughs> yes, in, a, in a, the a sector. Collaboration with the yes, we oh. do have a collaboration with Perfect. Yes, yes, that, that, that has been born right, right here. Yes. <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, well, that has been a very insightful, uh, you know, conversation, educative for, for you. Uh, so even if you are done with your degree, you can still pick up on a skill yes. and specialize in it so that you can be a better employee or employer for that matter, whichever uh, way it throws you, you definitely have the opportunity to advance yourself. That brings us to the end of this conversation. Our key starter does come up.